Thank you. I'm delighted to be back. Um, could be a little warmer, <laughs> uh, but it is um, great to spend time with you. And I thought this morning as I was getting dressed, I thought, darn, I had a perfect slide to start off this morning. It was um, a group of children going trick-or-treating. And one of the children was dressed as a nurse. And they're walking down the street. And the one dressed as a nurse turns to, you, to the others and says, that was weird. At that last house, the lady offered me a job. <laughs> so so you have it, you'll have to visualize it yourself. But thank you for having me back. And um, I look forward to a very energized day. And hopefully, I'm going to share some thoughts with you, but also move to an action level. So basically, we're coming together to talk about building a workforce for the future, particularly in psychiatric mental health. And so as thinking about what we should kind of weave through today, I thought about the strengths that you have based upon the summit last year. Clearly, Beacon is a valuable resource. It's one of the few groups like that, state groups, in the country. And therefore, um, you could be a leader in moving forward this agenda item. Also, your policymakers see the value of nurses. And I think that came out clearly last, last year. And that's very important in terms of buy-in. And then your Nebraska Action Coalition is very strong and effective. And I think it could be a national model for moving forward the IOM report. So these were all things that emerged last year that I think we need to build upon. And finally, these nursing summits. It's a unique opportunity to come together. So this is the second of three summits. So we really have to kind of now move to a more a proactive way of tackling these issues. I like this slide. If you're not the lead dog, the view never changes. So hopefully you will be the lead dog in some of these initiatives. So let's talk about where do we go from here. And I always like to start with the big picture and then drill down to specifics. And believe me, we are going to get to specifics. And if I'm talking fast, it's because I have a lot to say. So consider this. What are the two most entrenched change-adverse industries in the US? Now, Christensen, who developed the theory of disruptive innovation, writes a lot about innovation in various industries. You know, the computers, the banking, we can do all that. But in one of his articles, he said there were two most entrenched, most resistive to change industries in this country. Can you guess what they are? Healthcare? and education. Welcome to our world. So I think it's, it's very important to realize that making change in these two industries has been identified nationally as very problematic. Let's think about that. Consider this. General hospitals overserve the needs of a relatively small population of very sick patients while underserving the needs of the larger patient population. That's the way our healthcare system is organized. Think about research. NIH spends most of its funds learning to cure diseases that have historically been incurable, while spending less on learning how to provide health care that is simpler, convenient, and less costly. There is almost no federal funding for that part of the health care issue. Also, we ask expensive health care institutions, think medical centers, and high-cost professionals, think physicians, to move down market rather than using less expensive professionals to do progressively more sophisticated care in less expensive settings. And that really impacts us as nurses, because that's what we're talking about there. And this, when we come down to behavioral health, we have now new legislation has just been passed under the current administration, allowing the mentally ill to once again possess guns. Mental health issues remain the focus of those involved in mass killings. So every time something happens, like Las Vegas, we look to see what was the mental health problem behind that individual's actions. And yet, mental health coverage continues to be the first thing that's cut or the first thing that's made optional in health plans. So how crazy is that? It is a system that is totally dysfunctional. On the other hand, we have to realize that change is all around us. You can just tick off all the areas that are experiencing change. You're experiencing it every day in your own work world. 
So let's look at change in two areas, the emerging impacts in healthcare and then in education, because those were the two areas. So in healthcare, what are we talking about? What's all the buzz about? Personalized medicine. Right, so through genetic studies, we will be able to identify the, for example, medication that potentially is more effective in working with this individual with this genetic profile. We talk about population health, which is interesting because I find that a lot of my other clinical colleagues have no idea what population health is. They say it, but when you really ask them, and if we're talking about service delivery redesign, we are not doing population health. We're simply talking about it. Technology, we're going to talk more about that today. And of course, big data. Now we have data analytics. And in all of your medical centers, they are beginning to use systems like Epic that can provide group data that allow us to analyze healthcare needs and treatment in ways that we never had before. Of all of these, I think the greatest impact will come from technology, e-health, and m-health. Let's talk a little bit about that. So in UCLA, they have been using a pharmacy robot for a year. This robot dispenses medication 24 hours a day, seven days a week. After one year, a million medications were dispensed, and the error rate was zero compared to non-robot pharmacists, also called humans, who have a national error rate of 3%. And just think about the cost savings in terms of personnel. Somebody who's working, a robot, 24-7, that would be a very expensive personnel expenditure. We all know about all the devices that now start to take our blood pressure and can read all of our signs. Well, soon this will be embedded. You'll have a little chip that you put right under the skin, and it'll give you a lot of feedback about your health care, not your health needs. Artificial intelligence, so I really want to talk about that. Artificial intelligence is not new. It's been around since the 70s, but only now are we seeing the implications of it. And for healthcare, that's through Watson Diagnostics. So what artificial intelligence does, it enables us to use massive quantities of data to come up with preferred or more likely course of action. Introducing Jenny, the mental health assistant which targets mental health professionals in the psychological and psychiatric field. This use case will focus on a day in the life of a Center for Addiction and Mental Health psychiatrist. On a regular day, a CAMH psychiatrist performs her rounds, checking on each patient from her client list. She will also consult with Jenny her new mental health assistant application when diagnosing new patients. This occurs on a consistent basis as the CAMH facility is one of the busiest mental health centers in Toronto. She first creates a patient profile containing crucial medical information about the patient. This data is stored in a patient database that Jenny will store in her memory as well as organize for future references. After gaining further information about a patient's condition, the psychiatrist will then ask Jenny questions about possible diagnosis and treatments. Jenny assists in diagnosing and suggesting treatment through utilizing her powerful capability to make use of big data. Jenny's corpus will include the DSM-5 manual and major psychology journals such as the Canadian Psychologist, Frontiers in Psychology, and the American Psychologist which contain thousands of articles Jenny can use to weigh probabilities for a diagnosis. Through having the ability to parse and digest a large amount of data, she can assist and expand on patient information with a comparison to previous cases, diagnoses, treatments, outcomes, as well as draw upon research. While learning from experience, natural language processing also enhances Jenny's capabilities. Jenny provides a second opinion and the psychiatrist evaluates Jenny's choices using their own expertise. In this case, the top three results show Jenny's confidence level for the patient's depression diagnosis. Cognitive behavior therapy at 90%, interpersonal psychotherapy 80%, and Prozac medication 75%. 
After consulting Jenny, the psychiatrist then prescribes medication and treatment based on her knowledge and the second opinion Jenny provided. This has greatly affected her daily routine due to valuable time saved in seeking opinions from other mental health professionals. This has also allowed her to diagnose 24-7, receiving feedback immediately from Jenny. Okay, the point being that artificial intelligence allows huge amount of data, of resources, to provide a best predicted outcome. It does what no individual can do. And they, we've seen this with cancer. They've used it um, in uh, New York, looking at cancer diagnosis. It's particularly valuable to pick up complex or not typically seen cases. So you may see a case of this particular disease once every 10 years, and you're likely to forget about it. But the use of artificial intelligence helps to put all that together. Now, it is not replacing people, and I think that's the big issue here, because it just gives us more of an arsenal, more information in which to do what we do best. And most importantly, someone needs to engage and relate to the patient, and that's where we, particularly as nurses, come in. On the other hand, we need to know how to use artificial intelligence and not be naysayers. So let's look at emerging impacts in behavioral health. Here's what we have. We've been talking about integrated care for years now. We know that populations in need, the young and the elderly, continue to grow in need and um, decrease in services provided to them. We know about the movement from hospital to community and various care delivery models. Last year, I showed this one slide showing the integration in behavioral health care. We are making slow and somewhat pitiful pro um, pro progress in that area. Most interestingly, though, a recent review of the literature showed that the role of nurses, either the RN or the APRN, in integrated care systems is not well defined, is not well described, and so we don't have the information for knowing the optimal utilization of nurses. We certainly know that both the RN and the APRN can be core providers in an integrated care model, they can help to decrease stigma that we just heard about. And also, they can engage in screening, triage, brief interventions, and referral. That is at the RN as well as the APRN level. If you look at our um, nursing textbooks, these are the things that we know nurses do. We promote and maintain health by managing the effects of illness. We obviously provide care. We manage and coordinate. These are the things that we say that we do making bios, culturally sensitive biopsychosocial health assessments, designing and implementing treatment plans for patients with complex problems, especially comorbid conditions. These next two are really important in today's world, helping to organize, access, negotiate, coordinate, and integrate services. And perfect example of that is the, um, the area, the clinical area of palliative care. That is a minefield for patients, and we can really play an important role in helping patients and their family. And then providing a healthcare map to guide them through community resources. You go to any group and talk to them, and you ask them, where's a resource for dealing with this? Do our own students know? And oftentimes, the answer is no. We do know that hospital beds, psych beds, are falling. You can see at one point we had over 400,000 um, mental health beds in this country. At the same, and here's a map, and you can see Nebraska right there in the middle. So you have between um, 26 to 32 um, beds per 100,000. You match South Carolina in that regard. That is a pitiful map. But this is even worse. And we know now that we have more mental health patients in jails and prisons than in hospital beds. Of course, the question is, are we taking our students to those facilities because they have a great learning opportunity there? And we're going to talk more about those opportunities in a little bit. Of course, we do know all about the opioid epidemic and um, what is or is not being done about it. 
In fact, you saw that it is a public health emergency. It has been declared a public health emergency, not a national emergency. And with a public health emergency, that means no dollars, no new dollars are dedicated to solving the emergency. So a lot of wordsmithing, but we're not really making any progress. And there's a recent article in the New Yorker magazine that talks about the Sackler family and how the distribution of opioids in this country um, were really pushed by the drug industry. And it's a, it's a great article if you have a chance to read it. Suicides continue, no matter all of the work that we place on suicide prevention. It's still the 10th leading cause of death. You can read these statistics. Um, you know among our veteran population, it continues to be a large problem, even though it has been a focus of the VA. Domestic violence remains largely unabated. We have made no progress. Every nine seconds in this country, a woman is assaulted or beated, beaten. Um, you see it's the leading cause of women and children witness that, which create generations of um, domestic violence. And of course, more recently, we've had a spotlight on uh, the sexual harassment of women. It's kind of all bubbled over. And um, all of these things are related, though. When we have people coming forth publicly and acting as if all action, sexual harassment of women is appropriate, we shouldn't be surprised then in the bedroom when bad things happen. And the last thing, of course, is that unbelievable natural and man-made disasters. Within the last six months, we're reeling as a country from hurricanes, earthquake, fire, fires, mass shootings, and just yesterday, eight dead in New York City. I don't know how you prevent that. I don't know how you prevent a truck from hitting people. What is most interesting for the man-made disasters, studies have revealed that after the physical wounds heal, after people physically recover, they, can, they continue to have significant mental health problems for years after the event. And again, we need to provide services to those individuals. That's the, the, the landscape of the country. That's the landscape our students need to be pre prepared to help moving forward. Finally, let's look at what's going on in education. That's always interesting. So first of all, we know that we have many proliferating healthcare profession programs. In South Carolina, it seems like a new program is opening up almost every other week, whether it's a PA, an RN, um, an osteopathic school, a pharmacy. I don't know how it is in Nebraska, but private in particular are popping up all over the country. Um, there's exploding information. So for those of us who are teaching, it's really hard to keep up with what's going on. There's just so much information out there. But there's also the possibility of using new technology to help us better understand how we can teach. And I'll just show you this short clip. This was, it's impressive. We've been teaching human anatomy the same way for 100 years. Students get a cadaver, then they look at medical illustrations, and it's completely two-dimensional, and the human body isn't. Microsoft HoloLens is a holographic computer that you wear. It enables you to bring your digital world into your real world. At Case Western Reserve University, we are focused on solving problems and creating new knowledge. My job is to teach, and I really think this could impact almost everything that we teach people. With HoloLens, you can see the muscles on top of the skeleton all at the same time. You can bring them in and out and exactly understand where things sit. You can take any anatomical part and show any of it. You can move it around, you can make it kind of translucent so you can see through the outside, and that really helped me understand like how cardiac anatomy worked. I actually had a moment where I found the aortic valve, and it was the first time that I'd actually seen the aortic valve in relation to all the other anatomical structures. You know, it was a way of seeing it that you couldn't do with an actual heart. I think this will improve students' confidence in learning anatomy dramatically. By creating simulations with the HoloLens that lets them have an experience where they can fail, that would be the best way to learn because we don't allow people to fail too much in real life medicine. With HoloLens, you could imagine having a class standing around a model, almost like a tour group in a museum, where they're all interacting completely naturally. 
I spend a huge amount of time to make sure they become the best professionals because it's all of our jobs to make the world a better place. How about that? I predict in 10 years, you know, all the simulation labs we have? Antiquated, antiquated, old school. Think about if your students just can wear the hologram lens, you don't, you can save on space, they can do it anywhere. Um, you save on money because they just buy that, um, that visor. Now the programs might cost something, but I mean, this is, this is being done. So this is not like a year, 10 years from now, this is a year from now. Um, and we have to think about alternative ways of using this technology to really um, enhance the student experience. It's amazing, isn't it? I would have liked to have had that when I was in school. So what else is out there? You don't have to do it all yourself. There's plenty of things out there to help you. So SAMHSA, for example, has this great website, Suicide Safe. It's a suicide prevention app for healthcare providers, and it has lots of stuff loaded on it. I'm asking you, do you use apps in your classroom? Do you use apps to kind of direct students? You know, with the knowledge explosion, there's never gonna be enough time to teach everything. We have to teach students where this knowledge is. So you can see this provides treatment locators, educational materials, et cetera. This is another great app um, that is um, available. It's called Interactive Body. And if you're teaching a class on substance use and abuse, this shows every single body system that is affected by alcohol. Again, our students are coming expecting us to use this technology. This is what they've grown up with. And so they take to these things very readily. Emerging impacts in education, if we're talking about that, we have to remember the rising costs of tuition and student indebtedness. It is that that is making us compress educational programs. So we have accelerated programs at my college. All my programs are accelerated. Accelerated BSN, we have no traditional BSN. Accelerated DNP and accelerated PhD. Everything's accelerated. That's a different world than I grew up in or I started teaching in. Diminished resources, so three things for all of us to worry about. Can we decrease costs or can we increase volume or the price? And there is a real pushback against increasing tuition, so that is not an option. And how much can you increase volume? How much can you increase enrollment? Because some of the other factors we're gonna be talking about and how much cost efficiency is there left in our systems. And finally, for academia, this is an important issue, nursing faculty salaries. How low can you go? We are losing pace with the salaries that our nurse peers make in the clinical setting. And the academic side of the street has to come together and talk about this and make some strong recommendations. And maybe AACN can take the leadership role with it because it is Clinical salaries and academic salaries are basically flatlined. And so we are losing good potential faculty because people can make $30,000 more in the clinical setting. I know that's true where I am. And then um, this is also one of my predictions. I'm going to write a eulogy for the demise of the textbook. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, t um, traditional texts books in clinical um, educational programs are dead. And I'll tell you why. I write, I do the revision on my book, okay, that takes a year. Send it to the publisher, that takes it a year. They take a year to publish it and get it all ready and proof it back and forth. By the time it gets in the student hands, that information is now two years old. Two years old. And that edition, because you revise textbooks every four years, that edition stays in their hands for four years, which means by the end of that, that edition, that information is six years old. That is absurd in today's world. Not to mention, all books now cost $100 or more. Students are selling them or not buying them to begin with because they can't afford them. No one reads all the content. You give them a 1,000 a, a page psych nursing book, if they read half of it, you know, but the problem is every faculty wants to decide which half they should read. So you can't just kind of slice the book in half. Instead, what I am proposing is you will be able to have a menu online from 
all different aspects of psychiatric care. And you will go in as a faculty and say, I want this chapter on schizophrenia, I want this chapter on medication, et cetera, and put it together for students who can choose to download it or not. Then those things get updated weekly, monthly, so you have the latest information. That's why I predict textbooks will be gone, along with our simulation labs. Implications for our specialty, that we have too few qualified psych nurse faculty, too few students who are interested in our specialty, too few sites for our students to have their clinical rotations, too few preceptors, and too much to teach and learn. That's what you and I are faced with every day, and those are the challenges we have to think about strategies. So, when I talk with my faculty, what are some of the challenges I face? Some faculty say, but we've always done it this way. Or I call these my Debbie Downers. You can try it, but it won't work. You have those? And then they're going to make sure it doesn't work. <laughs> Basically, I think we're all adverse to piloting new approaches. It's much easier to continue doing the same thing we've always done. And this is a real problem. Our accrediting and licensing boards are champions of the status quo. They, in fact, restrict our ability to do things more creatively. Look at simulation. They pass laws about how many hours of simulation is acceptable within nursing programs, and there is zero evidence. In education, we do not practice evidence-based education. We don't. We talk about it in clinical practice, but there, are, there, there was no data. Now, there was one. Um, NLN study that finally came out, but that's pretty pitiful. In addition, if I were an accrediting body, I think we should write into the standards that every school must pilot something new every year. We, they should be promoting alternatives, not restricting them. And then finally, the workforce reports that come out are pitiful. Um, HRSA just released one saying we're going to have an oversupply of nurses. That's a joke. I don't know where they live, but I'm happy for them. <laughs> so opportunities and challenges. When the wind of change rises, some people build walls, others build windmills. You are the windmill group. So I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking about moving your agenda forward, because I think that's important at this second summit, that we really now, you know, we, we go to these conferences and these meetings, and we get a lot of good ideas, and sometimes we even get excited, but we go back and we're like, oh, I got a lot of stuff on my desk, I'll take care of that, and I can't really remember what that idea was now. I could go back to my notes, but I can't really find them. Um, so I hope that we can come out with some specifics. And so in the handout, um, that it, I think is posted online. As I talk, you will notice that some of the items have boxes in front of them. But I'll get to that in a minute. First of all, so I'm going to suggest that we be both strategic and operational. Never, ever think outside the box. <laughs> That's great for cats. It's not good for us. We have to be willing to take risks, and we must be focused. So I tell my faculty that what we need to constantly do is experiment. And what's an experiment like? You're trying something new. You have an idea. You hopefully have done some literature review, if there's any literature out there about it. And you try it. And what happens? You get positive results or negative results. Now, negative results we frequently label as failures and then everyone goes home and feels bad and doesn't want to try anything again. Instead, a really good experiment means both of those findings are important. If it works, that's great. If it doesn't work, that is important information for you to know so you don't replicate it. And we should be publishing those things so we share what works and what doesn't work. Um, so for stra strategic and operational, we need to have some guiding principles. They must be calculated risk-taking, not just willy-nilly. We have to use our digital and technology expertise. Data analysis. So let me talk to you about data analysis. We talked about big data for the hospitals, right? And they're accumulating all this big data. I don't know of a single hospital that is taking their big data findings and communicating them to their colleges of nursing and medicine to frame the curriculum. 
There is, shouldn't they be feeding us the results from the big data so we can, our community or population health course, that would be a great place for us to use that big data to design the needs for our community. Did you also know that there is now big data in terms of your courses? So there are programs, and we've just purchased one in our college, that allows us to um, bring the data relative to students to the faculty member. For example, how often they accessed a particular thing in the course, how much time they spent on it. So you get a profile and can pick up students who are having tr uh, trouble much easier. And they kind of do the data analytics for you. So you might want to look into that. And obviously, collaboration, quality, creative thinking. Quality is critical because you have to keep your eye on the end game, and that is quality. So in your handouts, I included a um, template for a strategic plan. I think part of the problem when we um, talk in conferences, et cetera, and we don't come away with anything is because we don't have a focus. So we use this in my school. There's lots of other templates out there. But basically, it allows us to set a goal. And then under a goal, we have one to four objectives that we identify. We come up with specific strategies, our expected outcomes, ah, the responsible party. Who's actually going to take this forward? And that's what we miss when we come to summits. Nobody leaves being the responsible party, a timeline, and then the actual outcome. Maybe you can use these as worksheets um, as you break down into your groups um, and move your agenda forward. I mean, you have three goals. One is education, one is practice, and one is policy. You can start there and then talk, um, think about what you want to do. But if you don't get it on paper, if you don't make it um, specific and accountable, it's not going to happen. And I think you're ready to do that. Now, the good news is there's tons of resources for you. You don't have to start from scratch. Professional associations, and there are some of them, following the money, and that means where are your state dollars going? What can you hitch your wagon to? Is there state funding, for example, for residencies for nurses? And then, of course, where are the federal dollars? So as you're trying to establish strategies, don't do it in isolation. See what's going on out there that you can take advantage of. And I'm just going to show you some of these things. APNA um, has a very rich website. It has tons of resources. So you see there's suicide competencies, violence prevention, um, tobacco dependence. You don't have to recreate the wheel. Go on these sites and use the information that they have available to you. This is from um, the National Council of State Boards of Nursing, and they have this online course on understanding substance use disorder in nursing. You could pilot it. Maybe you want to assign it to your students, and then you don't have to use that classroom time to cover this content. Instead, you can talk about cases. Students like you to change things up, and we're going to talk about that in a little while. This National Council for Behavioral Health is a rich resource. You should um, tag that or bookmark that website because um, they just have all kinds of resources. They will send you updates on what's going on nationally. But as you can see, I took a screenshot just on um, some of the resources that, I, that they have, but this is they have topics from A to Z, just a wealth of information there. And it is timely. It is up to date. It is current. This um, Relias company is actually, this was a webinar that they put on on using telemental health. So if that's an area you're not familiar with and you want to hear how clinical services work with telehealth, you can just tap into a webinar and get all that information. Um, that, again, is, is free and accessible. The, National, uh, the Mental Health um, Association, they have um, a certification process for peer specialists. If that's something your state is thinking about or has, um, again, don't create the wheel. Go ahead and look on these sites. This is an interesting slide. This is the fiscal year 2017, and these are the um, states and showing their Drug-Free Communities Program Coalition. If you look at ne for Nebraska, you will see you have four existing coalitions. The past year, 
um, you did not apply for a new coalition. But $89 million were awarded this past year to new coalitions. That money is just hanging out there, and certainly you could do more than four coalitions. I understand meth continues to be a big problem here, and it seems to me that there's a lot of opportunity to move forward in that direction. When it comes to the opioid crisis, I mentioned last year the Surgeon General had a sign on and take the pledge, and when I was here last year, only two colleges of nursing in the state had signed on. Um, they have taken off the names of the colleges that have signed on, so I don't know how many of you have signed on um, since we were here last year, but that is still a website that you can sign on to and get resources about opioid um, treatment. This is a great white paper, the ATT white paper, How to Prepare Students for Integrated Healthcare Systems, and it's a focus on substance abuse. And um, this year, I don't usually do this, but I gave you a bibliography, and it's on your bibliography, ATTC, so you can um, access this white paper. It's not long, but it tells you what students need to know. What, you know, I'd take advantage of that if I were teaching that content. Here's another website. This is out of Massachusetts, and I was thinking about your website uh, that you mentioned. Uh, and this goes, this takes the job feature of behavioral health to another level because it has lots of resources. We're talking about recruitment, pe recruiting people into our field. You could take that, your current job-focused website, and really blow it up and expand it and include other things. You can include why would someone want a career in behavioral health? What are the resources? What are the job opportunities? You can make it really dynamic. And so that's a recommendation that you can take on tomorrow since you already have the web page. You can then just expand it. And um, I think that would be a fantastic idea. Then we looked to SAMHSA. I said, follow the money. Where's the federal dollars? So you see one uh, $144 million awarded. This was before it was declared a public health emergency for the opioid crisis. Has the state gotten any of those dollars? Look at 14 million in suicide prevention. These grants come out all the time. Um, they're not particularly difficult to write, but the problem is you often have a very short window of time. So you kind of have to have your ideas behind you. Talking more about nursing, so hopefully HRSA is the website you go to and you have the advanced nursing education grants. So those come out every year. Um, they are to address the needs of community and the clinical workforce to enhance your curriculum, your preceptor recruitment training and evaluation, um, and to shape the experiential training of advanced practice students. We have this grant. Um, it's a yearly call, so uh, I think it hasn't come out yet or it just came out. My associate dean usually writes those grants, but again, out there, good money. Here's a new one that just came out, the Behavioral Health Workforce Education and Training Program, BWET. Kind of an odd name, but there it is. Um, it is not limited to nursing, but um, it includes uh, behavioral health workforce, any kind of clinician, uh, looking particularly at rural and medically underserved areas, think Nebraska. And you can see it's focused on um, expanding internships and promoting more interprofessional work. So that grant came out, and literally it had to be turned around in a month. And I called together my team, and I said, I want us to apply for it. They all groaned. And then they went back to their offices and started writing. And so we received this grant, $1.3 million. Look at the four objectives, or the four, yeah, I guess they're objectives of our grant. This is our grant. The first is to um, use some of the money to provide additional stipend support. One of the reasons we're not attracting people to the specialty is because we don't have stipends or scholarship monies for them, let's be honest. The second um, objective is to expand our innovative community partnerships. So we're all struggling about where do we get community placements, um, clinical placements for our students. This allows us to knock on different doors than we had knocked on before. Um, 
It also, we've written in some didactic and experiential training in the use of interprofessional competencies, and then we have to share our success with other programs. You know, numbers two and three, we were gonna do anyway, right? You have to do that. And so, even though it takes some effort to write the grants, it's really worth it in the end. So, now I'm moving down. That's strategic, let's go operational, all right? How do we make this a reality? And I'm gonna talk about four things. Who are your faculty, clinical preceptors, and practice role models? Second, what are you teaching? How are you teaching it? And where are you teaching? So to me, from the education realm, those are the areas to look at. So the first question is, who are your faculty, clinical preceptors, and practice role models? And we had this discussion last year, I remember. I remember us talking about that when the students go into the clinical setting, as you mentioned, Bridget, they, their role models aren't there. So some questions to ask. Um, your teaching faculty, are they prepared in your specialty? I hate it when I hear people say, oh, anyone can teach psych. They can't, it is a science, and yet because of the shortage of faculty. And if your faculty aren't currently prepared, send them to get preparation or have them take some of these online courses or programs. Think about what professions can serve as preceptors. We talk about intercollaboration, right? That's a big thing. Do we allow physicians, psychologists, um, uh, maybe social workers supervise our APRN students? And if not, why not? Because they're few and far between. How do you assess your practice role models? Do you ever do an evaluation of who are the nurses in the practice setting to see which units are best or which clinical areas are best or which preceptors are best? And then, are your fa faculty passionate about psych nursing? To me, if you want to recruit students into our specialty, you have to have an undergraduate faculty, psych faculty, who is passionate, and the students get turned on. I know that's exactly what happened in our institution, and we now have a pipeline of students who want to do psych nursing because of the passion that they've seen in their faculty. Do you offer your clinical faculty and clinical preceptors any benefits? So, and I'm not talking money, although that's a huge issue. And again, I think the profession needs to take that on because the private schools are coming in and charging for preceptorships. We are a state school, we cannot do that. We have managed to um, join with our sister state schools to agree none of us would do it because once you open that door, you've lost the battle. But what else do you offer your preceptors? We offer them a, you know, not, you can't just be a preceptor because you wake up one morning and you think that's a good idea. We have a toolkit for them that teaches them how to be preceptors. We offer them educational opportunities. Yes, we don't have money, but we are rich in other um, opportunities. We have a pin that we specially designed. It's called a clinical preceptor pin, and sometimes little things mean a lot. It's, it's prestigious. And then can academic and faculty, academic faculty work in the clinical setting? So let's say you have, you're in a clinical setting and the, the nurses in that particular setting um, are not the best role models for your students. Can your faculty go in and work with them with the support of administration to kind of improve that environment so it becomes a real two-way street and just instead of a place where we send students to see the good, the bad, and the ugly? In your handout, there's little boxes next to these because I thought you could go through and check off which ones you have or which one is a TD to do. All right, let's move on to um, what are you teaching and let's start with the pre-licensure, the BSN students. They all should be taught how to screen, triage, and refer for mental health issues. The sixth vital sign is what I call it. We should also be teaching them mental health first aid, just like they have certification in CPR and BLS, they should be certified in mental health first aid. That is out there, that is available, that you can just click on it and get it and incorporate it. Motivational interviewing, and I know you have a session on that this afternoon, that now is just bread and butter. That is essential content for anyone actually in any clinical specialty. Risk assessment. 
Again, risk assessment and crisis intervention, no matter where these nurses who graduate decide they're going to work, they need to be able to assess risk and they need to know some basic de-escalation and crisis intervention skills. Nurses in the emergency room are getting injured at a phenomenal rate, and it's partly due to the drug crisis we have in this country. But we need to be teaching all of our students those skills at some level. Also, care coordination and case management. In a lot of integrated care systems, it is the RN who is doing the care coordination and case management, not the APRN. So somewhere in your program, that needs to be incorporated. Suicide prevention, we still have a lot of stigma. Should you ask someone if they have suicidal thoughts? We need to be discussing that in with our students. ESPERT, how many of you know what ESPERT is? So that is a national program. We actually have a HRSA grant to teach ESPERT, which is screening, brief intervention, um, and treatment for substance use. It is, you can Google ESPERT, it is a program endorsed by SAMHSA as evidence-based. And we have a grant to teach ESPERT to all of the medical students at every level and all of our nursing students at the undergraduate and graduate level in an interprofessional dynamic. There's tons of resources, but every student should know ESPERT. The basic elements of CBT, I'm not talking about being a therapist, but you know, um, re refocusing, there are just some basic strategies of CBT that nurses um, should be applying. And then finally, when and how to ask for consultation. So we always know that nurses, um, they really don't practice above their license. They know when they have hit, hit their limits, but how do they ask for consultation? Whom do they ask for consultation? When do they ask for consultation? Let's move on to the graduate level. So here are some things. Are you teaching the integration of psych content into all NP tracks? Yes, we do have a psych mental health um, dedicated DNP track. But our faculty found that while we'll always need that specialty workforce, it is the PNPs, FNPs, and AGEROPs who need to know psych. So our psych faculty integrated 70% of the psych content into those other tracks. And on your bibliography, I think the second article um, describes what we've done, scaffolding behavioral health concepts, um, bills, and P student competencies. I mean, we have to have a better prepared nursing workforce, not just psychiatric nursing workforce, and that is our responsibility. OK, this one gets me. Why do we have a course in pharmacology, and then we have a separate course on psychopharmacology? That is the schism, the dualism, that got us into trouble in the first place. If they need to know pharmacology, they need to know psychopharmacology. That is not a separate or add-on course. We should be teaching only evidence-based interventions, some other ideas, telephone triage. So now we're getting into the technology. Telephone is not a big um, <laughs> uh, new innovation for technology. But do you know the largest employer of nurses in South Carolina? Now you're probably going to think it's my medical center or perhaps another one, the VA. It is Blue Cross Blue Shield, the largest employer of nurses. So our graduates are going to these insurance companies, and they are the ones on the phone do we teach them how to triage? How do they learn that? Proficiency in stepped care decisions, and that's part of the triage process. How to treat via telehealth. OK, so telehealth is when we talk about new care modalities, it is here. It is, we just received one of the two national grants for our national, uh, for our telehealth center. Um, that's how people are going to be accessing care. Now, the other issue is it's not just putting an iPod in front of people. You have to learn how to do telehealth. So do you have a course somewhere in your, or at least some classes somewhere in your curriculum on how do you do telehealth? It, there's lots of resources on the web for doing that as well. But we should not be graduating students in 2018 who do not know what telehealth is, and how they can participate in it at whatever level of nurse they are. 
how to engage challenging populations. So with all of this technology, okay, the other part of it is patient engagement, the nurse-patient relationship. We have to not neglect the roots of where nursing came from. And sometimes it's very difficult to engage, um, it's particularly our behavioral health populations. So te teaching them how we do this. And then, of course, team-based models of care. But I am tired of, team, of nurses always being the team member. I think we need to teach our graduates that they should expect to be team leaders, how to provide consultations, the business aspects of advanced practice, how to enact full scope of practice, and policy and advocacy. And I know, again, one of your group, breakout groups this afternoon is going to be focused on these things. But do we teach them it's a business? Healthcare is a business. Somewhere we have to include that in our content. Again, there's too much to teach than we could ever do. But we have to give them the resources. We have to show them where they could go to in order to uh, learn these things. And then finally, how are you teaching? So are you scaffolding the psych content? That, what I mean by that is they should be getting the, the basic essential elements of um, psychiatric care in their very first course in fundamentals, not waiting till they get to psych. Now, that means communication, right? That means establishing a relationship. I'm not talking about the interventions, but are you scaffolding it? And again, there's an article in, um, in, in your bibliography on using the flipped classroom. How many of you are using a flipped classroom? Not as many as should be. I know it's difficult when we kind of mandated our faculty do it. We had some disasters. Um, and then we had some that the students thought the faculty walked on water. So what you think about doing is, oh, let's bring in a consultant, right, to teach how to flip the classroom because we, no, we had faculty whose students were saying, this is the best thing we've ever seen. We had those faculty teach our faculty. Are you still teaching special, in specialty and disciplinary silos? And we all are, and that's one of the reasons um, we created this virtual interprofessional world where students from six different professions can come together focused on a patient issue, but that's a whole nother talk. Are you utilizing technology for any time, anywhere learning? Are you using simulation? And that is, people say, oh, simulation in psych, that doesn't work. Sure it does in terms of case presentations, et cetera. But remember, where you're gonna be doing simulation ten, five years from now is gonna be in a very different way. And then are you comfortable? So we talked about a lot of content, but you know, we all went through our educational programs a while ago. So what about our comfort in teaching motivational inter interviewing or de-escalation or SBIRT? And how are you gonna get that knowledge? So can your school help to support you getting the skills you need to stay up to date? And this is an interesting one. I think we should ask our students when we present some clinical practices, ask them if they see them in their clinical setting, and then give that feedback back to our clinical partners so we can enhance um, care. I think that's a really good idea. Finally, where are you teaching? The impact of DEUs, I'm delighted that you'll be talking about that. We find them to be fantastic. Can you create virtual learning pods? Where are your clinical placements? Where are the patients? They are everywhere. They are in jails and prisons. They are in homeless shelters, but they are in schools. They are simply anywhere you find an individual or their family. And then how about this? So we've had the restrictions with supervision. You know, you can only visit so many sites. We use telehealth to supervise our students now. It works fantastic. And are you involved in nurse internship and residency program? Our hospital had a terrible residency program, post-BSN residency program. We blew it up. And we are now working with them together in collaboration to design one that is really state of the art. Finally, in terms of practice, are you practicing to the top of your license? And if not, why not? What are the barriers? How can you tackle them? Are you using simple screening tools? And are they standardized across settings? 
And are you triaging patients based on symptom severity, type, and intensity of service needed? That is part of the problem of uh, integrated care systems. They're treating all patients the same instead of saying, this patient presents with this kind of symptom that needs this kind of provider or this level of symptom that needs this level of provider. We can't treat everyone as the same. And are we specifying treatment pathways and interventions? Are you using clear referral guidelines, developing algorithms to level care, developing and monitoring care metrics, designing popu population health improvement initiatives, and leading collaborative teams? These are all the elements of practice that should be implemented, and again, if you meet in work groups, you can talk about which one of these are, going to, are we going to tackle, how are we going to tackle it, what's the timeline for it. Finally, for your to-do list, this is really important. I think you should make a priority to track and monitor where your psych MPs are practicing, rural versus urban, how many underserved. That's going to make your case. Your state already values nurses. You are so ahead of the game, but you're going to need data to continue that valuing process. Do you have a mechanism for collecting that data? And then finally, it would be very interesting for your integrated care settings. Can you go in there and do a deep dive and find out the current and potential roles of nurses in these settings? What are, you know, what's their preparation? What are they doing? How are they contributing? What are the finances and um, clinical outcomes associated with them? Finally, because I think I'm pretty much on target here, look for the unexpected. So I was at a, a, a party and somebody had this beer. It's the world's problem solver. And I said, where have you been all my life? If only I knew there was a beer, that would have been so great. However, then my daughter sent me this photo. She works in New York um, and they were visiting the Moet and Chandon company. Um, and uh, for a business relationship, and this is their vending machine in their company. <laughs> and I thought, man, have I missed the... <laughs> Our... <laughs> I thought that was fantastic. And, you know, my faculty are saying, how soon are we going to get our Moe and Chandon? So, in conclusion, we have a lot of ideas on the table. You have a lot of meat and potatoes, so to speak. But if you don't kind of organize and agree on some strategies and some operational issues, when you leave, you're going to get busy with life, and things will kind of dissipate again, which we certainly don't want to have happen. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you so much for the, such a, really a wide-ranging and I think just rapid fire, uh, I would say overview of all the fields of healthcare innovation education as well as mental health, really quite impressive. Thank you so much, Dean Stewart. So I think we had time for a couple of questions and uh, uh, does anyone want to lead off with any questions or comments kind of based on this dialogue? Certainly, I think we, we hit upon just about all the work that is being done in this room or envisioned for the future, so I'll take a ask for a couple questions or comments from any individuals. I'll be around all day, too. Sounds good. Okay. I've stunned you into silence. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable. Well, I'll, I'll make a quick comment, uh, which is that um, I really resonated with many of these ideas, and um, I really liked an education year piece that we should require piloting every year. I thought that was a very interesting piece. And rather than always being compliant, you know, are we actually pioneering? And, uh, and I thought that was fantastic. I'm not going to put uh, Dean Sebastian on, 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 on the uh, hot seat about you know, f nursing faculty salaries, but uh, we'll just keep, we'll keep those in the minutes, Dean Sebastian. <laughs> but uh, but uh, certainly this piece about uh, recruiting the best people to work in healthcare environments to train is, is really a big deal. The third piece I'll say is on the, on the clinical preceptors piece. That is a national dialogue that we are struggling with, particularly with the burgeoning number of, uh, of uh, sites that sometimes are paying preceptors, uh, which I know academic uh, centers cannot afford to do. And how do we really recognize them? Sounds like you've had a way to do so. Um, and then uh, I really like that piece about telehealth and other population pieces where 
well, I think I, I would agree that we talk about them a lot, but, uh, but truly implementing them in the future. And then also uh, having nurses take on leadership roles, and as you put it, not just team member, but team leader, I thought it was fantastic. So very, very well done. But uh, Dean Sebastian, would you like to uh, come up and, uh, at, I, I don't know if we have a mic, but uh, uh, maybe, or, yes, or I think we're recording, so if you wouldn't mind coming up, you can also come up here. Thank you very much. I don't know if you do sound. Okay. Just take it. Thank you. So, a, here we go. Now it's green. Um, AACN, as a matter of fact, is taking on the issue of faculty shortage, which includes salary levels as well as encouraging people to enter faculty roles. And, and this is where my question comes in for Dr. Stewart, uh, thinking about faculty roles in different ways and asking ourselves who can be faculty. You know, what is the faculty role? How do we think about teaching the next generation of students, whether they're entering practice or advancing in practice or becoming faculty members themselves. So you mentioned DEUs, which is a way of, of incorporating clinical expertise into the teaching team, if we think about it that way. Could you comment uh, additionally, uh, Dr. Stewart, on your thoughts about ways to expand the teaching team? You mentioned learning from our patients, and so I'm not necessarily suggesting patients as faculty, but just how do we think broadly? Oh, that's a superb question because, again, it's, we're doing the same things over and over again. We talk about teaching interprofessionally. Everybody does, right? And then if you look at colleges, there are only physicians on medical school faculty. There are only nurses on nursing school faculty. It, you know, it's, it's laughable. If someone landed from another world, they would look at us as if you are missing everything. In our school, we have non-nurse faculty. We have psychologists. We have sociologists. Um, now, we know for accreditation, faculty have to have some responsibility in discrete areas for courses. But we have to find out ways in which to blend them. We have the requirement that it, you must be at least a master's prepared, unless you're taking a clinical group under a supervision of a nurse. We have to look at these. We've also moved to the direction of requiring that every clinical course has a patient come and present their experience to incorporate the patient and family experience in every clinical course. It's wide open to which area in that course they want to be there, and they could have them more than once. But, but some faculty have done it, but what happens is you find some other courses haven't. So we just mandated it as our way of what we are calling committing to patients and families first. Then why can't they be? In integrated in some of our initiatives, reviewing some of the materials we have. I mean, I think this traditional notion of who is faculty is not going to get us where we need to go, but it's also not making us as rich as we could be with the different experiences. So the, the other thing I'm a big um, advocate for is our DNP faculty being tenure track along with our PhD faculty being tenure track. You know, we create caste systems within our own academic institutions. We have to stop that. We have to stop the up and out. Do you all have up and out? Because that is crazy. I just think that was designed decades ago. So if I have a faculty member who's an assistant professor and gets fabulous teaching evaluations, I mean, off the score sheet, and she or he doesn't want to write more than three articles a year to keep in rank, doesn't want to write the five articles for associate professor. Are you telling me that I have to, in five years, say you have to go? That's what up and out says. It, we are not valuing and rewarding the diversity of what we have and making people playing to their strength. So a lot of these rules, et cetera, we have to do away with and think more broadly. What do they add? What do they bring to the table? And possibly, how expensive are they? Because some, some alternatives are less expensive than others. The whole notion that um, you have to have a certain ratio of clinical faculty that are part-timers to full-time faculty, we have to start thinking about all of these things because they were those, those, there's no evidence to support them, and a lot of those decisions were made 
a decade or two decades ago and they no longer fit. Can you have telework faculty? How does that fit in? How does accreditation view those individuals? Those are all things that should be on the table. So thank you for that question. Yes. I was just say sometimes as faculty, we think we have to teach everything, so I think I know everything about psych, whereas some of the apps you showed were phenomenal, and we need to build those in. Exactly, and I know our psych faculty, they actually have students teaching students, so they break them down and they give them a problem or a situation, and they tell them, go find the resources and you have to present to the other groups of students. And I mean, they love it. There is nothing like, and they're all over the web and they're talking to people, and it's, again, it breaks up that whole didactic piece. So just being creative, and, and don't, don't worry if it flops, because we've done a lot of things that have really flopped, and we've learned from them, and then we go on, and we tell the students that, you know, we tried something new, and it didn't work, and you're going to do the same thing when you graduate, and so that's how you learn. Life is a learning curve, so be courageous. Thank you. <laughs>